I'm Kerry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind the scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is Purple Roads. Welcome to Purple Roads. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this week we're in Los Angeles with John Tartagula. We have so much to talk about here. John, how are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm three hours behind, so my day's, you know, getting started earlier than yours. So I'm, uh, I'm just, I'm taking in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm here in Fort Worth, Texas, and we got too much sun today, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're having that too, believe me. <laughs> uh, I am thrilled that you'd be on this show. Um, there's so much to talk about here because you're a puppeteer, an actor, voice actor. You've just done so much different stuff. And there's yeah. so many places I want to go. But I, I want to start, how did you get started really into the industry? And, and did you start out as a puppeteer or was it acting or, or what was your interest? I started out, uh, I mean, I think people say this and it sounds silly, but it really is true for me. I don't remember a time I wasn't performing. Uh, my, my parents, uh, I grew up in South Jersey, uh, New Jersey, and my parents were both involved in theater. My mom's an actress and a singer, uh, still, still does that. My father was a, was a musical director. Um, and he doesn't do that as much anymore, but uh, so I grew up backstage. I always was was a backstage kid. I, you know, my earliest memories are either being backstage or being in a theater. Uh, so I always, and I just wanted to do it. You know, I just looked like fun. And it was such a, a, I'm so thankful to have had that upbringing because it was such a fantastical upbringing. But I remember cast recordings being played all the time. My father loves opera. So opera was always in the house. There was just always music and performance and, and fantasy that surrounded me. Uh, so I knew I always wanted to be a performer. And then when I was about seven is when I found uh, puppetry. I, I uh, you know, I grew up like most kids watching Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers and things like that. And certainly was influenced by that. There was a, a local show called Carol and Paul on the Magic Garden that I loved that also had puppets in it and they were performers. But the, the thing that really like changed my life was Fraggle Rock. Uh, finding <laughs> Fraggle Rock in its original run, towards the end of its original run, on HBO just changed my life. And I was like, that's what I wanna do. Um, you know, and it just, it was, at first it was the love of the show. And then I actually had this like very visceral visual, I'm one of those people that remembers visuals really strongly. And I, I have this visual, uh, visceral visual memory of being in my room, looking at the, the uh, soundtrack to Fraggle Rock, like one of the albums and seeing the character names, you know, Jerry Nelson as Marjorie the Trash Sheep, Gobo Fraggle, Steve Whitmire as Wendy Fraggle. I was like, oh, there, there are people, oh, <laughs> people do this. And all of a sudden it was like, that's what I want to do. So yeah, and I mean, that's really what started it off was, was wanting to perform and then finding puppetry as a way to be anything. You know, I loved that escape. I love that you, with a puppet on, I could be any character and any, I could be male, female, old, young, chicken, <laughs> chicken, animal, mineral, vegetable, you name it. Uh, so that, that's really what started it off. We're, we are going to talk a little bit uh, about Frank Rock later. There's yes. a lot to talk yes. about there. Um, so getting into puppetry and, you know, we've had several puppeteers on this show. And then when I worked on Barney, we had several puppeteers. And it's yeah. really interesting. It's such an interesting a uh, challenging art form. Yeah. So how did you, did you start, you know, were you practicing in the mirror? Did you create your own puppets? Were you buying puppets? I'm really fascinated where you went. Yeah, I, well, first of all, I mean, I had the, the one thing that I think is the luckiest, if you can get this when you want to be a, uh, an artist of any kind, you're very lucky, which is I had the support of my family. Yeah. Um, you know, having my mom, and my, and my dad and everybody in my life, eventually my stepfather, my stepmother too, all say, go for it. Like, you know, no one said, oh, you don't want to do that, right? So I think that's like the number one thing is when you have that kind of support behind you, I was really lucky to have that. No but, question about, I want to jump on with that. No question about that because I had the same. You can yeah. imagine me going to my parents and saying, I'm going to be a purple dinosaur. <laughs> Barney was not known 
when I got the audition and when I yeah. started doing this, no one knew who Barney was. It was only a Texas thing. And so you can just imagine my parents who luckily- Like what? Yeah. Right, but they had, you know, my mom was a dancer and my dad had played uh, drums, a musician at times. So they were like, well, we support you. We're, you know, we're not yeah. exactly sure what, what's going on, but we support you. So no, yeah, having that was lucky to have that. Oh, it was, it was in, so valuable. And, you know, I think, I think, uh, I mean, I, I was, I was young enough and I was a kid of the eighties. And so long before the internet, long before we had 24 instant, 24 hour instant access to everything. Right. So, you know, I, I, I wonder what it would have been like being a, a puppeteer growing up now where you have so many examples and so much access. But so to answer your question, I mean, I, I, most of it for the first seven, eight years of my interest was self-taught. You know, it was, it was watching anything and everything I could find on Muppets and Henson, um, you know, bless my mother for how many trips she took me to like Blockbuster video store <laughs> where I would like scour for like anything that, that was Henson and Muppets and watched it all over and over again. Um, you know, it was, it was funny. I think one of the things that really kind of helped me was at the time, I, in 1989, I believe it was, um, so I was 11 years old, um, Jim Henson had the Jim Henson Hour on television where he really showed a lot of behind the scenes stuff. So that was my access to a lot of behind the scenes. But a lot of it was just honestly, like you just started off with, like staring in a mirror with a really cobbled together bad puppet I had made right. and just learning the basics. And I, I remember, I remember understanding the mechanics of it pretty quickly. I think that that was, oh, I always came from, from a physical place first. I always understood the movement really pretty easily. It was the character and the voices and the comedy that I feel like I came to much later, but it was, I always understood the physicality, which is why I started working for the Muppets so young is because I could hold my own in, in choreography and background scenes and things like that. So, but really, yeah, it was all kind of self-taught for the, for, for the, for, for the majority of my early years. Yeah, it's so interesting as you're saying that I'm thinking about about today where it is access immediately, but maybe that gave you, you had to put a lot of your own stuff in it, right? You had to be really oh, creative yeah. and think outside the box because you didn't, you couldn't just say how to be a puppeteer and Google no, it. No, no, exactly. And there was no, you know, it, that's a great point. Yeah, and I think that I, I, I mean, it's kind of what I feel about kids nowadays anyways, like there's not a lot of time for, for, for just play and error and right. learning from your mistakes. It's kind of like having that, you know, I was a latch, so my parents divorced when I was seven years old and I, I think I was seven years old and, and I, uh, my mom was a single mother. So having, I was a latchkey kid, you know, I spent a lot of time by myself after school while she was at work. And I think having that time to literally just create and make and figure things out the best way to glue foam together. I didn't know. I right. learned by doing, you know, I, 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 same thing with, with all of my puppetry. So I think, and I think that having that time to fail without any pressure of delivery or any pressure of being a professional, it was just fun. Right. Just that, that, that sense of play, I think is, is how I really learned, you know? And of course, then as you get older, you start making a community around yourself and you start to find out, Oh, this is how you do this. This is how you do that. But Oh my gosh, like I was just taking chunks of foam and fur and right. hot glue and probably almost burning down the house and just sticking stuff together. But but I love that. I mean, those are some of my happiest, happiest memories is just is just making. Well, and, and we weren't watched all the time. You know, we didn't have social media, not everything we did, because goodness gracious, how many times I messed up. I mean, oh yeah. You have to fail really to succeed yeah. in this. And you know, you just have to throw caution in the wind and go, well, I'm just going to do this. And Well, I think what, what's funny with puppetry is, is uh, kind of like what's happening with, with, with musical theater performers and, and, and you know, singers. And, you know, you're, you're watching these 13, 14, 15 year olds who are unbelievable because the access that they have at such a young age now to how to's and examples of is so much younger, so so they're they're further ahead, right? right? So now you see puppeteers come in who are you know teenagers who are mind blowing at improv and comedy and voices and puppet building. I'm just like, oh my gosh, like you know. So so, but it, it but it's wonderful. I mean, I think it's just that because there is that access, and the same thing with musical theater performers, right? Like yeah. you know the fact the fact that you know when I was 15, I knew like 
five musicals and and half of those were the ones that we had done in our high school or our, right. our school but like you know now all these kids have a catalog of every musical every composer every cabaret performer like it's it's just amazing you know the access level has changed so much do they uh, do they ask you for tips do they ask you for or or they go i got it or do they are they still wondering well, you yeah know, how you did this and that well that's the interesting thing is that you know like you know if you want to be a musical theater performer there's a thousand places you can turn right now to learn how, right? right. I mean, besides just like a YouTube t tutorial, you right. can take classes, you can go to college, you know, your local, chances are your local, you know, uh, community center has, has some acting sure. classes. Like I, it, it's such a, a attainable thing. Puppetry is still this weird, small art form. It's more exposed than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly more in use because of theater and television and film. Sure. But I mean, it's still kind of like, this small little world and it's like where do you go to learn how to be a puppeteer so there are great classes online but but yeah it's not that part hasn't expanded there's no there's no like um you know it's it, it's not like you're gonna find in, in your local downtown a, a really first class puppet class you know right. that's gonna teach you it so it's still kind of something you have to learn really by doing you know um but i but i kind of love that that it's a little bit of like a, a smaller community I, you know, I, I, I want to talk a lot about Avenue Q because it really, I'm a theater guy and I <laughs> absolutely, it was just such an amazing show. But I think as we go into this subject, the, the tough part about puppeteering for that had to have been the fact that everyone sees you. You know, yeah. I think we started with the Sesame Street, we just saw the puppet. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you're there too. And so they're watching yeah. you and your facial reactions. How did you learn that to get comfortable? Because it's two performers, right? You're performing yeah. with the puppet and yourself. It was really, it's funny. I mean, it, it was a total, I like to think of it as like a, an alternate form of puppetry in a way, because, you know, first of all, I mean, that show was so unexpected, right? It was, it wasn't, you know, and I, you might know this, but I, a lot of people don't know that the show was, was not, it wasn't intended to be a musical. It was going to be a, like a, like if you can picture like what crank anchors was on comedy yeah, central yeah, yeah, yeah. where it was going to be kind of an adult puppet show in the vein of sesame street or children's television but it was going to be televised so you know it we you wouldn't have seen the puppeteers it would have just been the puppet only wow um, I, I did not know that by the way That's yeah funny. that was the intention and what we did was we we they the writers wanted to try out these sketches that they, I mean, it was just a bunch of sketches. It wasn't even, there was no storyline. There was no Kate and Princeton love affair, none of that. Right, right. It was just, it was four or five, I think, different sketches that stood alone, kind of like a Sesame Street, like individual yeah. pieces. And then, so they wanted to present it to friends and people in the biz just to see what people thought of it. So they invited us to do it. I got asked to do it because they wanted someone who, could, who could, had a singing musical theater background, which I did, thankfully. And we held the puppets like we would you know, on television, but just a little bit lower because it was a long night. And we just kind of were like, let's just hold them here. I mean, I can't even tell you how innocent it was. It was like, so like, let's just do this. And what ended up, ha you know, and we, again, thinking it's a television show. Right. But what people ended up leaving that night saying to everybody was, seeing how you guys did that, seeing how the puppeteers worked was just as fascinating as the material. So from that night, literally that one night and the reaction from it, the show morphed very quickly into being a theater piece. And then it became this whole other world. So to answer your question, I took a rambly road to get there. No, but, no, no. Uh, we learned as we went because it, it was about, it really was about sharing the spotlight, you know, because all of us in that original company of puppeteers uh, had all had musical theater backgrounds of some sort. And of course, when you're on stage, there are so many rules about how you perform in sure. your body. And of sure. course, when you're a puppeteer, there's so many rules. And if there's a lot of puppeteers, for example, who are so expressive here and so expressive here, but not expressive here, right? right? And then there's people who are the other way around where they're so expressive here, but this doesn't do the work, right? So luckily we were all pretty well versed on both, but our director, Jason, I give him a lot of credit for it. He really helped us sculpt, like basically how to get 50-50, you know, essentially. Yeah. And there are moments in the show that are so beautifully created with where the spotlight's focused you know where we're standing on stage where your eye is trained told to go to 
uh, example would be like fantasies come true. There's a very specific moment when I do Rod when he's laying in bed thinking about Nikki, right? There's yeah. a very specific moment where the spotlight is only on Rod. And then there's a very specific moment where the spotlight joins with, with me. And I didn't know that was happening until I actually like saw the show as an yeah. audience member. I was like, oh, but it's, there were all these moments that were designed to help you know where to look. But yeah, it was a little bit of a lesson in like, okay, like, so do I hold the puppet here or here? And is this a moment that just the puppet reacts or do I react to? Or, or, you know, a note would be something like, you know what, Rod's reaction there is what we're watching. Be careful you're not pulling focus with your face or vice versa. We need right. to see more reaction. So right. it was a learning process. It was a learning process. And so I always think it's interesting to watch when people do productions of the show, how much of that just like you figure out as you go. Yeah. Well, that was, I mean, that was groundbreaking when yeah. that show came out. And I, I'm curious, did you, were you nervous about what the reaction was gonna be to show like that to, I mean, you, you hit some subject matters and, and did some things that really weren't talked about. Um, and, and then I with think, puppets, cause everyone thought back then, you know, puppets and Sesame Street and the Muppets and. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't it was somewhere time, else. It's hard to think that it was 2003, which doesn't seem right. long ago, but was long enough was long ago enough that like it still was very racy and very different to do that sure. um you know we we literally and it's hard to it's hard to believe this now because of where the show's gone to but like yeah. when we when we got the off-broadway run which was only supposed to be i think like four weeks or something like that we were thrilled we were like <laughs> oh my gosh we have a legitimate off-broadway run right. at this very well-respected theater we were so happy. And I think, I think that we were thinking, you know, let's hope people show up. Let's hope people like this. And let's hope it gets maybe extended by a week. I mean, that was our biggest hopes and dreams. Um, and it's funny, I don't think I was, I think I was, you know, there's the, 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 there's the Italian boy in me Sure. Who's worried about everyone being happy and having a good time, getting enough food, and be so? Yeah, there yeah. was that. There was that part of me that was worried in the sense of like, oh, I hope everyone likes the show so they have a good time. I wasn't really worried about the subject matter because I think we had done enough readings and things like that that it was like, oh, people want to laugh at this. But I think what we didn't expect was the because it's such a nor it was such a normal world for us. You know, we we all were from the world of puppetry. Right. We we all. You know, one of the one of the kind of the part of the reason the show even came to be was was you know puppeteers when you're working on a kids television series tend to during the breaks when the cameras aren't rolling to be a little bit naughty. Right, right, <laughs> so, right, right. A little, little loose, loose, little loose. You know, it's like, are we okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's it's that wasn't so shocking. I think, yeah. I think the, the the I can't describe it other than uproarious reaction to the show yeah. in that off Broadway theater was amazing. The only time I was worried was when we moved to Broadway because there were so many people. It was like, we, it was like almost like, it wasn't even like, it didn't even feel like it was in the same city, if that makes any sense. It was like downtown, we were this, you've got to see show that everyone couldn't stop talking about. And we were the, we were the new kid in town, right? Right. When we said we were going to move to Broadway, it's like we went into a different land. Like all of a sudden it was like, they'll never last. Who are these people, these weird puppet people? Right seven people in front of one set on Broadway. Like it was, it was, I, I, there's all this fun footage that you can see now of like, you know, critics saying it'll never run, it'll last a month, you know. So coming into Broadway, that was, I mean, it was thrilling, it was my dream come true, but it was also a little scary because it was like, it went away from being the pressure of, am I gonna remember my line off Broadway to, or, or do we belong here? Right. Like it was a very different kind of pressure. And then of course, thank God, everything worked out, we were successful, but, um, but that's what I remember. I remember the the pressure and the um, the importance of, of focus changing when we moved uptown to Broadway. But you got to explain. I've been to New York a lot and and seen Broadway and Off Broadway. Those are like the the audiences that go to Off Broadway like get it right. And mm -hmm. I think you get to a more general public that's going to go to the Broadway show that's going to spend you know even back then hundred dollars for a ticket. Yeah. And all the, you know, the, they have an idea of what they're going to see, but don't always know exactly. And so yeah. it's, it's a lot of pressure getting on Broadway. It's, it's a lot of pressure and it's a lot. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think the off-Broadway crowd is, and it's, off-Broadway's even changed so much now from, from back then, but 
it used to be it was you it was expected that it was experimental and weird and different and edgy and challenging and it, it you didn't necessarily go to see an off-broadway show because you expected to get your money's worth meaning right. like in 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 opulence and special effects or that you went because you loved theater and you right. loved that downtown sense. You know, the best example I could give is like a little shop. Do you know what I mean? Like a little shop of horrors where it's yeah. like, you know, it, it, there's a reason that show works so well off Broadway, right. you know, it's that kind of feel. And I think that the, when you move to Broadway, economics comes in and sure. the business comes in and the, and the, and the, uh, you know, recouping comes in and the national tour comes in and the Tonys come in and all these different pressures come in where you're servicing the business side of it more than you are the artistic side. I think what, what we were so lucky with is that any of the changes we made for Broadway really were for the betterment of the show, not because it was Broadway. So, so I think we escaped what a lot of other shows don't, where some shows move to Broadway and everything gets plussed, everything gets inflated, everything gets, and it's not always because it makes it a better show, it's because that's what everyone's afraid. If you don't have, the show won't be successful. And it's probably why it was so successful. That you, I, I that you so. stayed, you stayed true to it. You know, yeah, I and was, I think that yeah. the authentic, sorry, the authenticity. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, I was just gonna build. It. I was gonna say, yeah. yeah. I think we also were, we we also benefited on being at the, at the at the the end of that Broadway super mega power musical curve that had happened, where right. you had the Miss Saigons and the Les Mises yeah. and the Phantoms and. Those were, that was just the norm with those right. big, huge shows, which by the way, I love, but like, you know, they are, they're big, huge shows. And I think people were excited about the fact that there was now these other smaller voices coming in that were not big in production, but maybe big in idea. So you've gone, you've kind of gone all over the place. Um, yes. <laughs> which, you know, which is fascinating. You got back into, so you you stayed with with them on Broadway. Then you went to Vegas, right, for a little bit. I did. I did. I opened the Vegas company. I was there for the first six months, which was, I literally two nights ago was 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 in a. We haven't. We don't get to see each other very often. The Vegas uh -huh. company, but we we went for like a group text uh, chat and just reliving memories and and uh, that was so much fun. It was so much fun to to uh, to to get to play in Vegas for six months and 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 uh, yeah, and that was a very different experience too. Because speaking of you know, a Broadway Tony Award winning show in Vegas does not a hit make. And so we <laughs> learned very, we, we had the opposite experience in Vegas where it was like, you know, we go from this like heady, amazing Tony Award winning, massively successful run on Broadway to Vegas where they're like, you got any Cirque du Soleil tricks in it? <laughs> like it's such a different, different world. Well, that is, that, I can see that because you kind of have to go as big as possible in Vegas. Yeah, and we added, that is, and I actually thought it was so fun, like we added some things in Vegas, a couple special effects and some adjustments to the show, and I loved it, I mean, it was really fun, but um, it, it's hard, listen, it's hard, I, and I, I get it, like if you come to Vegas and you have two nights in Vegas, yeah. you know, you have Celine Dion, Elton John, Cirque du Soleil, you know, uh, Donnie and Marie, right? and this, and this weird show with <laughs> seven people in it, and everyone's got clothes on. So what are you going to see? You know what I mean? Like, like I got it. I kind of get it. Like, looking at, I was sad at the time, but now looking at it, I'm like, I get it. it. It was a hard sell. But I will give them credit that, that, that you know, they, everyone believed in it working in Vegas so much. And we got to do some fun stuff. But. So you win a Tony for this show. Yeah. What do you do next? Like, where do you even, what, what, do you breathe for a second? Do you contemplate or do you just go for the next job? Well, it's funny. I mean, I, I was, I loved doing the show. I loved doing the show. Um, it was, it was hard. I mean, it was a hard show to do physically and vocally. Um, you know, and I, the, other, the other thing too, is when you do a Broadway show, there's, there's so much beyond the eight performances a week that you do. You do a lot of, in our case, anyway, you do a lot of press, you do a lot of appearances, you do a lot of functions. So uh, I was a little burnt out. Uh, you know, about a year after we opened on Broadway. And I had this unbelievable experience where, you know, I was 25 years old and um, had a change in my life, a seismic change in my life. You know what I mean? I went from being this anonymous performer who was happy to be anonymous, you know? I right. didn't have dreams. I never had dreams of being rich and famous. I had, or anything. I had dreams of 
of just l being on Broadway, I would have been happy to be like tree number four in the background of The Lion King. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like I didn't have any, I didn't have any aspirations to to necessarily be, you know, a star. Right. But, but. But it, there you are. Then, all of a sudden, it happens. Then, yeah, it happens, and all of a sudden, everyone says, "Well, what's next?" And I, you know, I I came out to LA for a couple of weeks, did a couple sitcom -y, audition -y things, which which almost happened, which which were exciting, but. I got back and I all of a sudden was asked by, through a series of an amazing events, was basically asked by the president of the, of the Disney Channel at the time to create a show for them. Wow. And I was like, wait, what? Like, and of course, you know, <laughs> we're, 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 well, okay. You know, working on Sesame Street and working on other kids' TV shows through the years up until that point, you know, you have that moment where in the back of your head you're thinking, oh, if I had my own show someday, dot, 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 dot. But right. you think, and I say this, people think I'm kidding when I say this, but I really mean it. Like, I was like, oh, maybe someday when I'm in my 60s or 70s and I've won the lottery by chance and I suddenly have money in the bank and can make yeah. my own show. Like, you know, I never thought that would actually happen. Right. Here I am at 25 with this opportunity to literally create anything I wanted to uh, for Disney Channel. And so I created a show, Johnny and the Sprites, um, and which was such an amazing experience. And I got to, I was the, you know, co-creator, co-executive producer and star of it. And I got to bring in so many friends to play with. And I learned so much doing that. It was, it was, it was really difficult. It was, uh, um, it was hard, and I've learned so much about it now, uh, to be on the other side of the camera, essentially, yeah. and the other side of the stage, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but we put together this beautiful family. Everyone had the right uh, ideas. Everyone had the right intentions. We made a show that I'm really proud of. Um, and yeah, that was the next thing. And then, you know, the, I actually learned a big lesson at that time in my life, which was that you can't do everything. Because uh, at the same time, I was shooting the second season of Johnny and the Sprites. I had uh, I got the offer to do Beauty and the Beast on Broadway as Lumiere, which was a dream role for me. I had always wanted to play that role. I, that music to me is my favorite music. I love Howard Ashman and Alan Menken; they're my heroes. And so there was just uh, no way you were going to turn that down. There was no way I was going to turn that down. And I got <laughs> and I got the offer in between seasons. I think I was in between. Giant the Sprite season. So, so I did also didn't know. I was like, well, I don't know if we're going to get picked up again. Who knows when it's going to happen? So went into the show, had literally the time of my life. It's still my, I mean, it's, it's shocking when people hear this, but it is my favorite Broadway experience beyond Avenue Q, beyond Shrek, as much as I love both those experiences very much. Beauty and the Beast, playing that role, singing that music, watching so many people have their first Broadway experience. Sure. It was glorious. Uh, and while I was doing that, we got picked up for the second season and I started shooting it. And while I was in Beauty and the Beast. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was 26 or 27 at this point, yeah. but I was getting up at, you know, five in the morning, going and shooting and producing a television series until, you know, six o'clock, taking an hour to scarf down dinner, getting to, you know, getting back in the car, go to New York City and do a Broadway show, not get home until 11.30 and not go to bed till two in the morning. So basically I was running off of, three or four hours of sleep a night. Um, a lot of pressure on a TV set to, if you're, I mean, you know this, uh, you know, a TV set is incredibly insane. pressuring, yeah. especially when you're not just in front of the camera like I was, but right. also having to make decisions. So long story short, I, I was on stage and being- <laughs> You burned stuff. out as well. I'm gonna hear that here in a second. <laughs> in front of an audience. I, I, had, wow. a, I had a, uh, I was not sleeping well, I was having, yeah. um, I was having panic attacks in the middle of the, of, my, of, the, of the night, which I didn't know were panic attacks. Yeah. I just would wake up like, like gasping for air and it was awful. And so I was on stage singing Be Our Guest, you know, and I remember, I can still feel it. I remember seeing stars, you know, oh. vision like stars. Yeah. And I remember I couldn't think of the words. Mm. Like in my brain, I was singing and singing, yeah. but my mouth wasn't moving. And I felt hot and I felt weird. And I looked over at the girl who was playing Belle with me. And I remember her eyes were like, because I was supposed to be singing to her. And you could see she's like, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? And I felt my heart just beating a million miles a minute, skipping beats, awful. Went to the hospital and this, the, the doctor basically was like, how old are you? I told him, he said, tell me your typical day. And I told him, and he was basically like, uh, all right, well, you have a choice. He's like, right. you can either, you know, 
do both of these things and have a heart attack in a year, or you can make a choice. He's like, you need to make a choice. So it was awful. I had to leave Beauty and the Beast. I had to make a choice. I had to go do Drawing Miss Brides. I had to finish out the second season. And it was devastating for me. It was so devastating. But it was such a, a I'm very lucky I learned it in a way that ultimately wasn't traumatic, you know. Right. But but that lesson, which a lot of people learn later, you know, yeah. I, I learned very quickly. And, and so it kind of made me rethink about priorities and taking care of yourself and I don't even know how we got on that but I <laughs> well but. I'm just sitting here going are you kidding me because I you know I I did it with Barney and friends and it's insane that's yeah. the amount that's involved and you're and and I was not behind the scenes so I can just yeah. imagine what all you <laughs> it's insane well and I'm and I and I'm a people pleaser and I take mm. things very personally I'm a very emotional person in that way and so I think you know, it. I don't think it was the actual physical work that did it to me. I think it yeah. was the emotional side of it where you're worried because you get an email that a script isn't working, you've got to rewrite it. Or, you know, you're thinking about that while you're worried about, you know, are we going to get picked up for a third season? Like, you know, sure. I think all that anxiety sitting inside of someone who's also not really taking care of themselves physically, I think it sure. just all compounded. And, and uh, yeah, so, so well, that was, you know. It's got to be a lot of pressure. Because it's your show. Yeah, and I, and I, and you know, I think because it was employing a lot of people, I mean, I really loved those people and I really cared about everybody who worked on the show. And I think, you know, we were a family and there is that kind of unspoken, no one would ever say this, like to, you know, no one would ever put this on right. you, but there's a pressure when your face and your name are what's, you know, essentially in front of the camera and what's right. maybe carrying the show, if you will. It was, it, I felt a pressure to make everyone happy. And I felt a pressure that if we didn't get picked up, I was a failure. Or if this episode wasn't good, then it would disappoint people who were watching. So there, I put a lot of that on myself, you know? And I think that, and you can, and listen, this is for a preschool television series, sure. you know? <laughs> like sure. I can only imagine, and, and, and that's how much sat on me. It, 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 that experience has always made me very, very empathetic and sympathetic for much more successful, much more higher paid celebrities, you know, who have that pressure on them. So when people say, you know, how could someone like Britney Spears go crazy or whatever, you know, and right. I hate that term, but like, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I, if that's even a, a, a 16th of what that feels like, then I, I can understand that pressure, you know, when you, when you feel like people depend on you. So, and I don't say that for sympathy. I say, cause it, no, I, I had that experience it. You know, I'm glad I, I got to understand that. Yeah, I understand it. And another part that's important, I, I, I think that people need to understand the audience of a children's show. Mm. It's completely different than entertaining adults. Yes, it is. And yes, it so is. I can just imagine the pressure of, I mean, those kids fall in love with what you're doing and-, and You have a lot of, you have a lot of weight on that. I mean, I think yeah. I-, think I and I've, I've always been, and this is, a, a, I guess, a benefit and a fault to some degree, but I've never been someone who can give less than 100%. I, I, I remember doing, you know, Shrek or Bean the Beast or Avenue Q or whatever, and people would say things like, oh, I'm going to give my B show today because they have a tire or whatever. And I was right. like, I, even if I wanted to, I can't. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a creature of that. Like, I yeah. feel like if you're not giving 100%, just because I think you're, we're so lucky to do what we do. Yes. You know, I never take it for granted that I get, I get to do what I love. So yes. I think that's it too. It's like, it's like, I am not one of those people who can be like, yeah, cut that corner. It'll be fine. I'm the opposite. I'm like, I'm like, no, it has to be that because it has to be this because, because I want it to be as good as all the things I grew up watching. You know, right. it's so, yeah. 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 Oh, absolutely. I know what you're saying a hundred percent because there's times I did a lot of live performances with Barney. Yeah over a thousand shows in five years you gotta they didn't come to see carrie yeah they came to see barney or yeah. you know you're whatever your character yeah, that's that you exactly doing right. over the different time and so you barney can't be tired you know you, that's you right can't be it doesn't matter if you're having a bad day right yeah and so you just gotta dig deep or find whatever it may be and and, and i got know. that from my parents too i think growing up with in an acting family or performance family like it was always like you know very young it was kind of explained that you know you're you're lucky to have an audience. You're lucky to stand in front of an audience. And, you know, on Broadway, it's like to your point earlier about money and stuff like that. Those people don't care if you if you had a fight with your boyfriend. They don't right. care if you are you know 
I don't know, upset because you didn't get a job. They paid at that time $150 to see you, you know, and yeah. rightly so. They deserve the same performance the audience last night got, you know, and that's, and that's, that's a, that's part of the discipline of it, but also like it's, it's, uh, I think what, what helps you keep perspective on like, you know what, leave your problems at the door, get on that stage and do your job, you know? Yeah. 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 And it's, and I think it's, it's so great that you learned it at an early age. And I think you yeah. just, you never let it leave. I mean, it's, it's there. There's not even a question about it. You just, you try to, yeah. You try to hold on to that. That's right. Yeah. So we, you got to do Shrek. And I yes. think that was that. I can't imagine. You put yourself in a lot of pressure situations, John, is what, <laughs> is what I'm seeing here. Is what I'm seeing here because, you know, yep. Shrek was such a beloved show. I mean, it's a beloved show. So to take it to Broadway and to take it in a musical, once again, there's a big challenge. Yeah, and that was really interesting because I feel, you know, I feel like I, I kind of got the the poo poo platter of of Broadway performances, like I, or Broadway opportunities, because you have like Avenue Q, where it's this little teeny show that never had any desire or any dreams of really being on Broadway, but has this Cinderella journey, right, of like right. going to the ball and being accepted and everything, yeah. you know. And we, we we all had our lives changed by that. And then I had Being yeah. the Beast, where I was a replacement, which is a whole other different experience, where you're just sure. going into this like moving. Co you know, you're a cog in the wheel of an already well-oiled machine. Sure. And then with Shrek, it was taking something that was a massive property, right. beloved, that had a company behind it who had the funds and the means and the, and the intention to go to Broadway and figuring out how do you make that a Broadway show. So it was like really, I mean, really, truly, and I didn't realize this until I was older, like coming at it from two different sides of that experience. Yeah. And it was hard. I mean, it was, it was, it was um, a different kind of pressure because it's almost like instead of proving that you belong there because of your talent or because of your subject matter, you're proving that you belong on Broadway because everyone expects you to be bad because it's a, it's a movie and it's a corporate, corporate right. thing, right? Um, so... I came into the process of Shrek during the workshop. They had done a few readings. They had done some other work on it. I came into the workshop and the workshop experience was so much fun because it was like <laughs> six weeks of just why not, you know, yeah. and the team, the cast and the crew, everybody was just like, it was, everyone was in on it, you know, and it was so weird and funny and bizarre. And I mean, really, it was like six of the most fun weeks I've ever had. And then we went to rehearsals for, for Broadway um, and we we opened out of town. We did like an out of town tryout in Seattle. So we were rehearsing for that. And it was kind of, again, having gone through a very different process with Avenue Q, it was, it was kind of shocking to go from this very like um, creatively centered, tight experience in the workshop mm -hmm. to the realities of putting on this massive, big show with, you know, a huge turntable and automation and special effects. Right. And, millions and millions and millions of dollars. I don't even know how many millions of dollars, but millions of dollars with a giant cast of a beloved film franchise that has the marketing people and the, the head of DreamWorks and this, I mean, it was, it was insane. Like looking back, I'm like, it's crazy. Um, that experience was just so different. And it was almost like um, if Avenue Q was, how do I put it? If Avenue Q was, um, playing in your in your in your college football game you know shrek was playing in the super bowl being launched out of a cat of a cannon right I, I don't know if that's a good analogy i don't play sports but like that's the best thing to do. <laughs> no but it, you, you've hit it. It, it yes it was it was so <laughs> different it was so different and and but that being said it was so fun because it was like you know i got to play pinocchio who of course was an amazing character to try to get to emulate from the screen but I also got to puppeteer the dragon and I got to play the magic mirror and the magic mirror was to my knowledge, still the only, you know, uh, live CG animated character with motion capture that we did every night. So I got to do wow. motion capture, which is crazy. So, you know, it was such a, an amazing experience, but it was, it was, I, I feel like whenever I think about Shrek, I think about laughing and just being so tired. <laughs> all the time. Oh, I'll bet. I'll, I'll, I want, I want to go so many places with this. Sure. Workshop first. Because so, explain to people um, yeah. about that aspect where I'm presuming you're getting to try stuff. There's, there's a freedom, right, to see what 
works and what fails. Yeah, I mean, the whole purpose of that workshop it, process is to figure out on its feet using what would be your ideal group of company members yeah. um, with the creative team, with the doors locked, what's the show, right? right? You don't have the sets, you don't have the costumes, so you have maybe some costume pieces if you need it. Yeah. and some props if you need it but that's it you don't have you're not on a stage usually there's no audience usually it's just going it's literally watching the composers sometimes on the spot rewrite something um and it is it's a big process of let's try it let's it's like a big pot of spaghetti you throw against the wall and you see what's what sticks so you know opening numbers we did probably in the workshop alone like five or six different versions of the opening number or, you know, the choreographer, I'm, I, I just, these are the memories I have. Like, yeah, yeah, I yeah, remember yeah. I, uh, at one point in the opening number, I was a villager along with the, the company in the opening number. And it was, he was like, you know, I was like, maybe we want to give a sense of like Shrek seeing the world as it should be in his eyes. So maybe some of you are juggling scarves. So we did like a day of scarfography. Like it's just a time of exploration without the pressure of there's a performance tomorrow. Um, so that's why I think it was fun because it was like, Fairy tale creatures and Lord Farquaad and puppets and a dragon and skeletons and elves and and ogres and it was just this ridiculous group of the best of Broadway and then watching brilliant writers like Janine Tesori and David Lindsay Bear working on the script and the score I mean it was just it was such a it was such a um, it was fun it was just it was I'd never you know it was very different from the Avenue Q experience in 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 many ways and so it was just a, it's just a fun time. Um, you know, and then again, like that, but, but that's, but that's what that is, you know, and then right. you present it at the end to an invited audience and some executives and, but you kind of still know that there's going to be work to be done and everyone's okay with that. Sure. So the pressure is different. It's not a pressure of, you know, is this the show? It's more of a pressure of like, are we going the right direction for the right. show? At least, at least in that case, because we knew we were going to do the show. You know, when you have a company like DreamWorks producing, you don't have to worry about it. Right. Right. I, I'm curious for you, you've done shows where you've created roles and then you've done these shows, you know, with, I mean, we're talking Shrek, but Beauty and the Beast, the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows these characters and, and you know, you're, you're following an animated version of this and, and especially with, with Shrek. Did you just say, well, do you use the movie as a, like a guideline uh -huh. and then just kind of let it go? Yeah, I mean, that's actually, I will say that that's one of the things I was really impressed with, with DreamWorks, specifically Jeffrey Katzenberg, is that they were, they were wonderfully loose on that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think yeah. that there was certainly there, look, you know, we know Shrek is going to have his accent. We know right. he's going to be green. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, you know, uh, like, you know, there's, there's certain things that you want to hit because they're iconic, right? Yeah. But like, like with, with the fairy tale creatures, in the movies, they were really just punchlines. They didn't have a whole lot of weight and yeah. they didn't have a lot of, you know, you could probably, you probably remember from the movie, at least at that time, that Pinocchio had like a high voice, but that's kind yes. of most of it. So they, they really let me find what that was. Um, and we went through a bunch of different versions of who Pinocchio was. I really struggled to find him, honestly, for a while. I mean, the voice that the guy did in the movie, to try to sing like that eight times a week, I tried it in the workshop for like a day and I was like, <laughs> nope. Like there was no way I was gonna be able to sing like that. It was like, oh boy, like that, that Grady. It really hurt to do it. Right. But so I knew I couldn't do that. But like they really let me find. I mean, there was a point where he was, you know, he was one way, then he was the other, and then even like the southern accent. I I genuinely cannot tell you why everyone loved it, but it just worked doing a southern yeah. accent. And they made to kind of backpedal why he had a southern accent. But anyway, long story short, like to answer your question, like yeah, it was really wonderfully loose. And then something like the Magic Mirror that style in the movie was certainly what they wanted that game show kind of thing but i got to bring my own flavor to it so i think they were they were great about that about not pressuring that you know everything had to be exactly by the books and because there was also stuff that just worked better theatrically anyway right. things that you could expand that maybe in the movie you couldn't do so um but it was that was again very different because it's not like avenue q where i whatever i wanted princeton and rod to be was up to me essentially you know, right. whatever came out of my voice. No one expected anything. It was just what I what I said it was. Um, and like with Lumiere and Beauty and the Beast, it's the most like you know, be our yes. guest is probably is is 
if not if not the title song Beauty and the Beast, it's the most famous song. So there was pressure on like everyone knows that Jerry Orbach performance. And I also come from the world of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? right. Like I had no I was gonna go in and be like, what if Lumiere, <laughs> beautiful high tenor, but like, I was like, no, I'm gonna do my best to choose Gary Orbach because that's what everyone wants. Right. You know? So, yeah. yeah, so I think it was kind of the same as Shrek where it was kind of in the middle of those two. I was like, I was allowed to be creative and bring my own thing to it, but I also really wanted to respect what had been, what people love about it. You know? Sure, which I think is important because, you know, I'm curious, do, do people go, oh, they didn't put this in? Like, are, do, oh, they know those what? so well. But if something's missing, you know, you're going to hear about it. Well, it's funny you say that because, you know, we had, there was one song in the film version of Shrek that was in the musical. Um, and it was 30 seconds long, which is that, welcome to do lock, yeah. such a perfect, right, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they put that in because it's so funny and people love it. But nothing else, because most of, most of the Shrek film soundtrack is pop songs that were either right. re-recorded or, or pulled, right? Right. Uh, the thing we heard over and over again, I didn't hear it, but apparently the, the, the you know, producers and stuff heard was, well, where's I'm a Believer? So we literally, you know, the show had been running almost a year on Broadway at that point, and they literally like, like called us in to put in I'm a Believer as the finale song. I mean, this is like after the tone, and it was like, <laughs> really? But it was like the thing that they heard. So, so yes, I mean, people did say, you know, where is that song? Like people wanted that song. And ultimately it was really a fun way to end the show. Like, like when we did it after our bowels and did it as the play out for the audience, they loved it. People sang and danced along and I'm like, okay, I get it. But it's just interesting, right? It's like, it's yeah. like, there's, like when people come to a, that's why I think it's really, I guess having been part of a musical, a movie that was a, or a musical that was a movie. Yeah. I feel it's silly when people say things like, oh, we're completely rethinking it for the stage because I'm like, well, but dot 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 like that is part of the reason why people are going to come see it so you right. kind of i think want to you know it's like i directed a production of the wizard of oz not too long ago and it was like there's just some things in that you don't oh. want to rethink there's a reason why people love right. that film right so dorothy's going to be in the blue dress yes you know? <laughs> and it's like it's okay to have some things be and then you can reinvent other things that people don't necessarily have a fondness to but you know it'd be like going to see shrek and shrek was blue and you know, had a had had a, a New York accent. You'd be like, that's different. <laughs> so yeah, that's not gonna work. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you definitely learned about expectations, and and you know, when we said lines from the film that people love, that they reacted to it. So it's 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 interesting. I, I'm also curious, um, Beauty and the Beast. Do you feel the pressure? You were saying this earlier. Do you feel the pressure of you're not the original cast? To, to live up to that or do, do you create your own version or yeah, I'm curious about that because I know people making decisions right when they're they're going to the Broadway show well it's not the original cast or oh I see it's on a movie. you see what I'm saying yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Just, you know obviously you don't get the job unless you are talented enough every single person I mean the talent sure. level is all the cast but I'm just curious how people feel or do you feel a pressure that you know when you're someone's role yeah it's hard I mean when you're a replacement I was like the I'm gonna, I mean, I'm making a guess here, but I'm gonna say like the 10th Lumiere, right? I mean, the yeah, show opened- that show in, ran forever. Forever, it opened in 1994, and I, I was in it in 2006, I think. Okay. So, you know, you can imagine that many years later, so many yeah. people have played the role. Um, you know, I come from the world of, when you walk into a, a show that's already running, um, I think your job is not to fix anything. And your job is not to rethink anything. Your job is to fit into a position to, to keep the show running, right? You are a replacement. And there's a reason why it's called a replacement. You know, you're not the original. Yeah. So, you know, I, I always found that to be true. Um, uh, for a short while, I maintained Avenue Q off Broadway. I, I was like the resident director off Broadway for two years uh, where I would put new cast members in and maintain the show. And I really, as a director, learned that lesson of, you know, sometimes people would come into the show who wanted to add a bunch of jokes, you know, right. wanted to make a, something, a, some, a, some, make a, a line that is definitely not supposed to be a laugh line, a laugh line, just to get right. a joke, or wanted to do something different just to make it different, right? Yeah. And that's actually not your job. Your job is, you know, uh, you know in, in that 
for very rare circumstance. You know, myself and Stephanie and Anne and Jen and Rick and Natalie and Jordan, we were the original company and we went through weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, in some cases, years of rehearsal <laughs> yeah. where we tried things, you know, right. and we found this is the show, you know right. what I mean? And we tried that moment and you know what? It doesn't work and there's a reason it doesn't work, right? right. And that doesn't mean that you can't be creative, but what, I guess I'm saying that it's a different mindset, it's a different discipline. And it's, it's hard for some people, it's really hard for some people to come into an already established performance. And it's not that you wanna imitate the person who came before you, it's not that. It's that you want to, you're always gonna bring yourself to the role because you are physically a different human being. Of course right. you're gonna be different, but, but you don't want to change it for, I can't think of a better expression. It's a little ridiculous, but to put, but you don't have to put your stink on it. Does that make sense? It does. Like, like, like you know, like it, it's like everyone knows that you're not. You know, everyone knew that I wasn't Gary Beach, the original. Right. You know, Gary originated the role in Broadway, the late amazing yeah. Gary Beach. You know, I could have never been Gary Beach. Right. I didn't want to be Gary Beach. You know, right. I but I certainly knew what he had done and the choices he had made as the original that I respected. My job was to stay true to what he had created. Yeah. There's room for anything, right? Like, there's, yeah. of course, the way I delivered a line is going to be a little bit different. But if I'm changing everyone else's timing, if I'm changing, you know, shows are, are machines, right? Yeah. The stage manager calls a light cue based on the way I say my line. Right. And if I just decide to change it up all the time, or I decide, that can really mess up the show. Yeah. Sometimes safety, safety comes in there too. If they call right. the trap door at a certain, you know, that's yeah. dangerous. So I'm, I'm being, giving a very dramatic answer to say, I felt, I have always felt that when you walk into a show like that, where I wasn't part of the creation of it, I wasn't part of the workshop of it, yeah. that my job is just to, just to fit in there, you know, be that cog in the wheel that goes around and does my job and gets off. And, and I think some people have a hard time with that because they want to get the attention for adding something or they want to say, look at me, look at me, look at me. And right. I was just so happy to be buried in those prosthetics and have that, those candles on and, yeah. and get to sing that music. And I just, you know, I, I, there were a couple of times where someone would say to me, hey, you know, is there any way you could deliver that line different because I'm calling that sound cue? I'm like, sure. Go, whatever you need, you know, because you just want to, you just want to keep it going. Right. I don't so know if did, I answered your question. I think I did. No, you, you <laughs> did. You did. It, it's, I feel that I, I know because I was not the first actor to play Barney. So I understand right. exactly what you're talking about. And I, I've seen it, you know, I've, I've seen that other side of what you're talking about where people want to add their stuff, but the character is what they're going for and you need to be true to that. So I, I that's such a good point. Yeah, of course you know that. Yeah. And I, it, exactly. I mean, I did, used to do costume character work when I was younger. I used to be uh, a costume performer at Sesame Place, the Sesame Street. Oh yeah, yeah. And so I was Cookie Monster and Bert and those guys. And same thing. It was like, there was very strong and understandably so character guidelines. And this is how Bert moves. This is how Cookie Monster moves. And you get someone sometimes who just wanted to like, make Bert, you know, dance a certain way. It's like, but Bert doesn't do that, right. you know? And it's not, that, it's not that I'm taking away from your talent. It's that like, that's just what's established, you know, and that's your job, so. Exactly, exactly. So you moved on. Um, I want to talk about Splash and, and Bubbles because you, yes. you went back and did a kid's show, but now you're doing a voiceover. So I, I love that you, <laughs> I mean, you've done all these different styles of, of performing, and I love that. So let's talk a little bit, uh, the, the PBS Kids Show's question. Yeah. Well, that was, it was such an interesting time. I mean, I, you know, Shrek, clo Shrek was a very, um, it was a sad ending. You know, we, we put so much love and time and energy into that show. And it was the first time I experienced a musical that was closing out of a lack of success, for, better, for a better way of putting it. You know, Beauty Beast. Sure closed we got our closing announcement while i was there i didn't close the show because of, of right. uh, having to leave because of giant sprites but because you weren't sleeping because i wasn't sleeping <laughs> but we but we got our closing announcement while i was there and it was a different kind of closing because it was like look guys the show's been playing 13 years right you know it's time and and with shrek it was like we were barely over a year when we knew we were going to close which was so sad it just felt like a big ugh, you know yeah and and i i had had this amazing you know, I guess it was six years of my life. No, almost 
eight years of my life where I had just not stopped. It was just like one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And it was the first time where that ended or I knew it was going to end and I had nothing certain. And it was really, honestly, it was really scary. It was the first time I kind of, since I was 18, didn't have wow. project, you know, uh, projected something. Yeah. And it, it honestly, I didn't know it at the time, but it put me into a major depression. And I kind of wasn't sure of what I was supposed to do. I felt, I, I didn't know if I was supposed to be an, just an actor. I felt like, should I just, you know, am, am, am I, you know, I love, I still wanted to puppeteer, but I, I didn't know what I wanted to do there. And I just felt a little bit like uh, lost. I felt lost, I guess is the word. And while I was at the end of Shrek, I had this opportunity given to me to create a puppet show for Royal Caribbean. They had this giant new cruise ship they were launching called the Oasis of the Seas. I don't know if it's still the biggest cruise ship in the world, but it was at the time. And they asked me to create this black light puppet musical, right? And so uh, we created this like 20 something minute sweet show with an original score and uh, at the best time putting on the ship and people loved it and it was just so sweet. And one of the producers involved with it in creating it was really adamant that it should be off Broadway. And I was like, what? Like, I was like, <laughs> it's the sweet cruise ship 20 minute show, like what? But the score was so wonderful and I got to write the script for it. It's my first time writing a, a theatrical production. Um, long story short, New World Stages off Broadway, saw it, fell in love with it and wanted it off Broadway. So we expanded it to an hour, opened it off Broadway, it did really well, considering it was a, a sweet one-hour kid show off Broadway. Right. Um, from a cruise you know, really, ship. <laughs> from a cruise ship, yeah. That was designed for a cruise ship originally. And um, I started having people say to me, like, you should think about turning this into a TV show. And I was like, really? You know, I, I just was so in it. I didn't see it. I was like, really? Yeah. Um, and then someone said, well, yeah, because it's blacklight. It almost lo looks like animation. And I had never thought about creating an animated series. It just wasn't something that I had, it wasn't my forte, you know, yeah. puppetry was, and live action was my thing. Sure. Long story short, I, I, I tell, say that a lot, but I tell long stories. Uh, I called my friend, Hallie Stanford at the Jim Henson Company. And Hallie and I had worked together when I was 21 years old, I, I, or 22 years old. I worked on a TV show that shot in Orlando, Florida at Disney and Jim Studios called Animal Jam for the Jimenza Company. And I played a character on that. Hallie and I became fast friends. Her first time executive producing, my first time uh, doing a full series for, the, for Henson as a lead character. Anyway, and uh, I called her and I, I mean, I cold called her. Like I literally picked up the phone and called. <laughs> and she had since become the president of television. And I said, uh, Hallie, you're, I don't even know if you're gonna remember me and she's like, of course I love you, Johnny. And she's that's how <laughs> she's full of energy and the most positive person in the world. Um, and I said, look, I have this show off Broadway. It's been running. She goes, oh, I know, I know what it is. I know what it is. And I was like, oh, okay. And I said, well, I was like, you know, I, I keep getting interest from people about turning this into an animated series, and I I really would love maybe if the Jimenez company would consider it. And she goes, yes, let's meet about it. Let's talk about it. Let's do it. Uh, which I've learned is very much Hallie. Just like let's do it. <laughs> and. Um, it was amazing. And then like within a month or two, I was, I came out to LA, had a meeting with her and Lisa Henson and uh, they were so behind it. They were just like, this is great. And then Lisa had the idea, I believe, to use what the Jim Henson company has, which is this amazing proprietary system called um, uh, Henson Digital Puppetry. It's this, it's this, uh, it's called HDPS and it is literally puppeteered animation. Wow. So they have this, this, this custom built rig where you put your hands into it like a puppeteer would hold a puppet and using this endless assortment of buttons and toggles and servos and things like that, what you do with your hands translates immediately onto the computer screen wow. and moves the animation. So if you kind of imagine if you've ever watched like, you know, when they animate a CG film like Toy Story, there's yeah. all those different, like it's almost like a skeleton right. understructure. Right. And that's what, the, it's same thing. It's like you're puppeteering that live. Um, and so they happened to have, and it was one of those like, you know, I, I, I believe in things from above. I believe everything happens for reasons. So I always say thank you, Jim, for this. Cause I've always, you know, I never <laughs> met Jim Henson, but I've always felt very, I, I really do feel like my career is because of him. Everything happens because of him. I, I, I remember leaving the, 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 the lot going, thank you, Jim, that day. But they happened to have a fish puppet 
live computer puppet they've been working on for another project. I mean, it's so, the chances are so small. And Lisa's like, oh, I think there's, a, there's this fish puppet that they've been testing that's a computer animated character on stage. Do you want to try it out? And I was like, sure, petrified all of a sudden that I'm going to like live perform in front of Jonathan's daughter for the series that I'm pitching, right? Right. I, and it's doing digital puppetry is very difficult. It's it's a whole other skill set. It really is. It's like it's like the equivalent of like dropping an Xbox in front of like a, you know a ninety five year old and saying go for it. Like right. it, it, it's like if you've never done it before, you're like what? So I not to say that ninety five year olds can't be amazing at video games. I, I guess, I guess. Um, but anyway, so <laughs> I, I I somehow mustered through enough that it didn't. Com- it was like a complete disaster. And Lisa was like, oh, that looks great. And that kind of fueled it. And so basically out of that meeting came Henson's support behind the animated series and we took it to PBS. So they were one of the first networks we pitched it to. They fell in love with it and loved that it was so science-based. And six months later, we were in pre-production. So it was really, you know, another kind of amazing uh, experience. And I, during that time, I got asked to come out to LA to do a, a series called Word Party, which is on Netflix, um, using the same technology. Wow. And so while I was here shooting that is when the series got picked up and I ended up staying in Los Angeles. Wow. So I, and I was really searching for, again, I think what you put out to the universe, it comes back, right? So I had ended a relationship that I'd been in for a very long time and I was looking for a life change, I was getting tired of living in New York City, <laughs> getting a little disillusioned by New York. And and so I think that this amazing draw came from Los Angeles for me to come out here. And and that's where I've been since 2015, um, getting a chance to to work. Now I work primarily for the Jim Henson Company. And it's just been, uh, it's such a full circle thing to start off wanting to work for the Muppets at, you know, seven years old, getting a chance to do that very young age on Sesame Street. And then ending up on the other side of my career, being out here doing that again. Wow. It's, it's just a, it's just a, a incredibly dream wish fulfillment kind of situation. Well, I, I gotta, I gotta finish with what you're currently doing because this is gonna excite people. I mean, this is really exciting. What you're working on right now? Yeah. So I, I am still pinching myself about this. So as I said, <laughs> you know, in the beginning, Fraggle Rock was the show that made me a puppeteer. Literally kickstarted my whole career and. Um, we're now working on a reboot of it. We're working on it for, for Apple TV and we're in pre-production now. It'll be out hopefully next year. And um, I, I have the unbelievable honor of playing Gobo Fraggle, who's one of the, the main characters who was created by Jerry Nelson, who's a, a personal hero of mine. Um, so getting a chance to, to play, I mean, it's, as I say it, I'm like, what? Like getting a chance <laughs> to, play, to play a character on, on a reboot of the series that made me want to do what I do, you know? And the, the, the quick story I'll tell you is that when people would ask me when I was like a, a preteen or a teenager growing up, they'd say, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? Um, before I told them I wanted to be a puppeteer, I'd oftentimes say, well, uh, something, I, basically I would kind of, I'm not going to say this as eloquently as I want to right now, but basically I would say something in the line of like, well, my, my, job, doesn't, my, my, my job doesn't exist anymore. Right. And they'd be like, what do you mean? I, be like, well, because set, because Fraggle Rock was the thing I wanted to do. I wanted to be on that show. I wanted to work on that show. I wanted to be on that set with those performers, doing those characters. And it was out of production by the time I was, you know, 11 years old. So forget it. Um, and I just, I mean, if you had told me at whatever age I was at that point, oh, just wait like 30 years <laughs> and <laughs> someone's going to reboot it. Right. And you're going to get a chance to not only work on the show, but play one of the main characters and executive produce it and write for it. What? Oh so it's, it's just been, it's just been a, a, an amazing, amazing experience. And I, and I feel like I'm at that age, I'm 42 years old now, and I'm at that age where I'm looking at my life and I'm going, oh my God, like all those times you, you felt, lost you felt you know we, i have imposter syndrome i feel inadequate all the time we all i think i think performers always do yeah. right yeah. um i look back and i go oh that experience was preparing you for this and that voiceover experience was preparing you to learn how to modify your voice to play global like right. i feel like i can now look back and go oh all of this actually it was the universe going like there might be something really cool <laughs> down the line you know, you need to be ready for. So it's just surreal. I mean, it's just, I know it sounds cliche and the end of my, you know, 
lifetime television movie to say this, but it feels like such a storybook dream come true. It's like, you know, to want something so bad as a kid and get a chance to do it literally word for word. It's just, it's insane. I cannot wait to see where you go after that because you have had one unbelievable career so far. Well, I'm scared. Honestly, <laughs> don't be it's scared. You say that. I'm scared. <laughs> I keep t- I keep telling my mom. I'm like, I'm scared. It's like this, this is my last year because it's like it's like you know to to it is it does feel very kind of like what's next. But I you know I I feel like every t- time in life we do that to ourselves, no matter yeah. what you do as for a career, every time right. you think like, oh no, it'll never be as or what's next or every time it, the world has a way of like you know putting you I think where you're supposed to be and and showing you that next lesson and and I could have never predicted anything that's happened in in the past <laughs> you know 20 something years of my life at all well I'm I sure you too right oh, like no, I mean no no, no 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 I no I never never saw it I never saw me doing this and I uh, this has been an amazing experience it just kind of happened well and you know what I think that that's what we're and maybe the pandemic has also made a lot, made more, uh, made this more uh, obvious. Is like, I think we are more capable of things than we think we are. Yeah. You know, and I think people learning new skills during the pandemic, or people like this, like learning how to yeah. use Zoom to record a podcast. Yeah. I mean, things that like you maybe wouldn't have thought you'd be doing. Like, I think it's amazing what we're really capable of as people when we really put our, our hearts and our efforts into it. So. You know, I think and sometimes you just, you just let it go, right? I think that's been the key, is to just. I mean, I'm obviously seeing it with your career and how you've done is just to not really think that much and just go do it when the opportunity's there. I'm yeah. I'm a big, the, the, the two things I I promote the most as a as a person, let alone as a performer, but as a person, is like hope and possibility. Like I feel like you have to have the faith and the hope that things are going to happen the way they're supposed to you know, and that is a little bit of letting go, but it's also keeping that positivity out there. Do you know what I mean? Like keeping your optimism, which is not easy to do, especially nowadays, but keeping that optimism, keeping that hope, keeping that, this may sting, but it, I do believe it's gonna ultimately get me the lesson I'm supposed to learn. But then I was gonna say, the other thing is, I think it's also like, never say no to an opportunity because it's not necessarily like you know there's there's the the, you everyone should have a final or hopeful destination yeah but there's so many different roads to get there and you never know what that that's that going around that one oak tree might give you an opportunity you never thought possible that's going to make you even more likely to get to your final destination quicker you just don't know you know i just i think it's so important to be open to the possibilities i think it's the key to it all and it's difficult and, and you get it and I get it. We all see it, but just doing it. And like you said, with the positivity, especially right now with what we're all going through with, with COVID is that you just got to keep that positive. No, we all need it. We all need yeah, that and positivity. I, I feel like I, I, I have to remind myself of this one every day. And I'm, I don't know if you're like this too, but I feel like I feel so uh, helpless sometimes when you see things going on in the world that you want to fix and shit. And I remember reading this Jim Henson quote that stuck with me and I'm not going to do it justice, but it's something to the effect of like, you know, he realized it's as he got older and maybe that's because I'm in my forties now I'm starting to think like this too. Like there's only so much I can personally affect and I can personally do something about, and I have to trust that everything else will work out the way it's supposed to and just help to, to, to help out the things I can do something about. And I think that that helps too when things start to feel really overwhelming in the world and you're watching climate change and you're watching government, you're watching all these things that you're like, ah, you know, and I wish I could do more. And you realize, you know what, the power I have is to do what I've been enabled to do and to, to focus on my family, to focus on my friends, to focus on my pets, to, you know, those are the things I have the power to actually do something about. Sure. But the other part of this, I, I learned this with Barney, you get put into these these position, these different characters, these different things you've done over the years. Yeah, and we can start with Avenue Q. You've changed people's lives. Mm-hmm. You've gotten people that would have always never taken a chance to take a chance, or they've learned love, or they've learned something from what you do. And so, obviously, what you need to keep doing is just what you're doing because well, I inspire people, even if you don't realize you're inspiring people. 
Well, you know, it's funny because a lot of people when I when I when I went when I did Giant Sprites when I did yeah. you know for Disney Channel, there was I can't even tell you how many people professionally and otherwise were like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> They're like, "You're starring in a Broadway show. You got nominated for a Tony Award. Your show just won the Tony." They're like, why aren't you doing? You know, you should move to LA and be a sitcom actor, be a movie person. Blah blah blah. blah. First of all, I had no, you know, delusions of grandeur of like you know like uh, I d I know I'm not you know. Uh, uh, Christian Bale, let's put it right, that way. Right, right, right. But but uh, I don't know why I picked Christian Bale. I'm trying to think of like another but, Jake Gyllenhaal. I'm not Jake Gyllenhaal, you know. There you go. But 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 I I I realized that like I was excited to do something, and I've always felt this way that would hopefully make a difference. You know what I mean? I don't care if it's smaller budget. I don't care if it's smaller scale. Like I love the idea of, and I feel this way as a, as an actor. Like one person watching something I get to be a part of that changes their their mind. And I've been accused of that. You know, when Rod my character who was gay in the show, you know, his coming out story now, it's not a big deal. 2003 yeah. was still something, it was still in the, in, yeah. the, in the national dialogue. And watching how people would react at the stage door, whether people who were in the closet and felt suddenly like they had a possibility, you know, or people who frankly just had never had their minds open to that struggle before. I mean, to your point, like that was such a rewarding thing. And I feel like now getting to do that on this scale, like with Fraggle Rock, where it's going to be all over the world, we get to tell lessons that are really impactful for future generations like that. I feel so blessed to have that opportunity. I can't thank you enough for being on here. I have had I feel, I feel like all I did was ramble. I just know so happy to talk to you. <laughs> no, you didn't. And I, I learned so much. It was fascinating. Is there any way I could finish up with having you sing something? Oh my goodness! What I do you know. want me to sing? Can you sing something from Avenue Q? I could sing uh, Princeton's. I could sing the opening. I would love that. Oh my gosh! I haven't done it in a while. <laughs> Sorry. Let's see. What do you do with the BA in English? What is my life going to be? Four years of college and plenty of knowledge have earned me this useless degree. Usually there was a laugh. I can't pay the bills yet, cause I have no skills yet. The world is a big scary place, but somehow I can't, oh God, somehow I can't, oh no. Oh, somehow I can't shake the feeling I might make a difference to the human race. I have never forgot the words before, but I also haven't sung that song in like a year or two. Yes, when I just put it <laughs> completely on the spot. So I love it. Thank you so much. It has been just an absolute pleasure, John. Thank you, same here. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for, for giving a forum for people to, to talk. Thank you. Well, it's, it's um, I can't wait to see Fred, Fraggle Rock. Yes. I just think it's so cool, can't wait. Thank and uh, I have to ask you to come back sometime. I would be honored to. Uh, I would love it. Well, thank you again. And thank you so much for watching Yay! Purple Roads. <laughs> we'll see you next week. And remember to keep your eyes, ears, and your heart open, and you'll find your Purple Road.